Good morning. Uh, many thanks for the invitation to present you something. Uh, but I must confess I feel somewhat forlorn uh, amidst all these museum experts. Uh, when uh, uh, Wayne asked me to present you something, I told him right away that I'm not a museum person. And moreover, the people where I did my main field work, uh, the Maka in East Cameroon, uh, stand out for very poor material culture. Uh, there's a sad contrast to their neighbors, the Fang. Uh, Ethnographic museums keep making uh, glossy volumes and beautiful expositions about the Fang. The Maka had nothing at all to show, apparently. So uh, I can't help uh, feeling a bit forlorn here. But Duane said that I should take something from my book, uh, Perils of Belonging. Does it work? No. Yeah. Uh, Perils of Belonging, since it touched on the theme of citizenship and belonging. So my challenge for today is to um, relate this book to the predicaments of museums in the Netherlands. And I completely share uh, what Duane was saying about the urgency of uh, uh, this issue. But for me, it's still uh, terra incognito, but I, terra incognita. So I will give it a try. Uh, I wrote this book, uh, These Perils of Belonging, because of my surprise that around 1990, uh, at the same moment that notions of autochtony and allochtony were creating havoc in several parts of Africa. You may all remember the bloody civil war in uh, Ivory Coast, uh, Cameroon, Congo, all uh, furious, really very nasty civil wars over autochtony and exclusion that exactly the same moment the Dutch choose to call themselves autochtonen in order to distinguish themselves from the other, the allochtonen. That is still a very remarkable event in kind of convergence, which makes you wonder. So therefore, the title of this book, Perils of Belonging, there's a heavy stress on perils. Uh, I should add that recently the topic of autochtony has become a bit dated for the Netherlands, so luckily I must say, because uh, last month uh, CBS, Central Office of Statistics, announced that they would no longer produce statistics in uh, terms of allochtony and autochtony, which is very striking because they stuck to it very stubbornly for more than 20 years, so we were constantly confronted with these strange statistics of uh, soon the Dutch population will be a majority allochtonen, and allochtonen is a very panacea notion, anything goes under allochtonen, so a very confusing notion. But now finally they accepted that they should uh, let go of it, and that's a major uh, uh, progress, but it doesn't mean that the basic issue is not still there, the issue that uh, Duane was touching upon, who is in and who is out. But uh, for today's topic, uh, what might be relevant in this book is that the comparison between, it was mainly a comparison between Cameroon and the Netherlands, and you may be uh, a little bit surprised at that comparison, but I'll point out why the comparison could be interesting. But the comparison mainly raised the issue uh, how the nation state can deal with internal differences. And you will be all quite familiar with that. Uh, the nation state has an uh, inherent tendency to hom homogenize, to, to make a unity, to make a national unity. It has to deal with differences, but that's always uneasy. So what I want to talk about is the struggle of the nation state. Uh, you have to confront there are differences, but how can you, the tendency to ignore them, to push them away, we get examples of that, and how can you uh, work with internal differences in a more uh, um, uh, productive way. Uh, just some very quick examples from both sides, Cameroon and the Netherlands. Uh, in Cameroon, independence in 1960 led to a determined policy of nation building. Here you see the first president of Cameroon, uh, Amadou Ahitio. He launched a national discourse that kept repeating the absolute necessity of national unity as a precondition for development. I must confess, I uh, went to Cameroon for fieldwork in 1971 for the first time, a long time ago. <coughs> And I was deeply disappointed uh, by the national ideology of uh, Cameroon, of Ahitio. In those days, we were very uh, uh, 
uh, uh, very motivated by figures like Castro and all that, the uh, voice of the third world, uh, Fanon. Uh, I was deeply disappointed by this deeply boring uh, discourse on unity. It was all the time unité, unité, unité. So these are the, this is the basic uh, unité, vigilance, and subversion. And uh, the, um, the way Ahito addressed the nation was really very flat and uh, superficial. Uh, only later on I began to understand that even this apparently shallow discourse was layered, that there were several layers. Ahitio very cleverly combined the emphasis on unity with what he called la politique d'équilibre régional, the regional equilibrium. Regional equilibrium in uh, practice is ethnic equilibrium. Every region, uh, which meant every ethnicity, was entitled to a fixed contingent of political post. Here you see the balance between unity and uh, di diversity. Uh, Cameroon is very diverse ethn ethnically. There are some uh, 200 languages or something like that, and there are an enormous amount of groups that always split off and that can combine themselves. Very confusing. Um, the consequence of Ahitio's scheme, and it, it is, he was a real politician, was that uh, an ambitious politician had to compete with someone from your own group. It's no use to try and, and topple somebody from another group. I hope you get that system, man, that if, uh, if you wanted to go up, you had to bring down somebody from your own group. So the co political competition was inside uh, the ethnic group. and. Uh, the competition remained hidden under an appearance of unity. The, pact the practice of this equilibrium policy was, of course, that ethnic divisions were reaffirmed as the framework for national political com competition. Politics took place in the context, in the framework of ethnic diversity, but uh, it was uh, covered by a kind of uh, appearance of national unity. Another practical effect that might be interesting for uh, museum people was that uh, Ahitio, uh, he was in power for more than 20 years, always tried to create a national museum and it never worked. Uh, of course, all the money disappeared, that was also a practice, but the more, uh, as a matter of content, the problem was that there were so many, uh, there was such a diversity of cultures, culture that was such a rich uh, diversity that it was impossible to strike a balance and that might be interesting for the Dutch who are also uh, have a history of struggling with the idea of a national museum. Um, let's switch to the other side. Uh, the, um, a longer history of nationalism in the Netherlands offers a similar picture that I think is interesting, apparent national unity that in reality hides very complicated and very deep differences. I can from personal experience speak about the last heydays for Dutch nationalism just after the Second World War. In those days, in the end of the 40s, early 50s, national unity was celebrated in all sorts of ways. Uh, it's very important to uh, remember how the old queen, and I mean uh, the very old queen, uh, Wilhelmina, uh, returned from London with the firm idea that now the Dutch had to be united. No time anymore for all the political bickering of the pre-war years. She would create the unity of the Dutch uh, around her. That is very important. So um, I must confess that I have played with the idea of singing for you a few of the songs we had to strike up in the first class of primary of the primary school, that, which I attended in 1947. But I quickly abandoned the idea, not for lack of voice. I can sing quite well, I would say. <laughs> but rather because these songs seem to touch once again a deep chord for many people. There is some, some, something of coming back, and these songs have become dangerous again, let me put it like that. Uh, of course, I have on the screen uh, Wie Nederlands Bloed. Um, I'm sorry for uh, the non-Dutch speakers. Uh, it is something, uh, those with whom Dutch blood floods through the veins sing with us. So it's all about Dutch blood and uh, free of foreign stains. That is very important. Dutch blood, free of foreign stains. Stains. This was the national hymn until uh, 1932, not Wilhelmus van der Sauer, but uh, Wie Nederlands Bloed door Daderen Floyd. Uh, 
1932, it was abolished as a national hymn by, hymn by the old queen. I keep referring to the old queen. Here she is. Because she didn't like it. But it's, no, it's not very clear why she didn't like it. And it's probable that she liked Wilhelmus van Nassau much more because that was for her about her own ancestor. And she felt very strongly about uh, her own ancestors. Uh, but national hymn or not, uh, we had to sing it in... Uh, 47, I was singing it with tears in my eyes. Uh, there was, of course, also um, Holland's Flag, You Are My Glory. That is this uh, beautiful song, um, especially the line, uh, I cry victory for sheer joy when I see you at foreign shore. And we were singing this uh, again with tears in our eyes at the very moment that the Dutch army was... Uh, engaged in the big, biggest military operation ever to smother Indonesia's uh, liberation. So there is a kind of uh, irony here. And uh, probably uh, the former Prime Minister Balkanende, when he referred to the VOC mentality, uh, the East Indies Company mentality, which he uh, posed again as an example for the Dutch uh, nation, uh, I think he was inspired by the same song. He's only a little bit younger than I am, and so uh, I'm quite sure that he also had to sing uh, Dutch flag, You Are My Glory, uh, in its school. So all this, I just uh, uh, mentioned these examples because there's apparently a very strong unity. This, this, around these songs, there was a very strong idea of the Dutch and uh, pride in our nation. Uh, again, it's um, important to... Um, uh, emphasized that this, um, this unity was apparent only. Underneath the unity, there was deep division. And of course, you may all be familiar with uh, pillarization, huh? the split up of the Dutch nation in pillars, uh, Protestant pillar, Catholic pillar, socialist pillar. Socialist pillar was coming up, emerging, liberal pillar, rather. Uh, I always thought that pillarization was an extremely boring notion. Um, uh, I had all these memories, of course, uh, to, to just an example. Uh, I was raised in the Protestant pillar. That's For the Dutch, it's very important to know from which pillar you are. I'm from the Protestant pillar. And I had to pass a Catholic school on my way to my school, which, of course, was a Protestant school, which meant that I regularly was beaten up by Catholic boys because they knew when I would pass and then they were waiting for me. So. This is about division in practice, but there's also a more theoretical note to it, uh, which suddenly became important with uh, Paul Schaeffer. Uh, Paul Schaeffer was, uh, he keeps changing uh, his position, but he has been very important by two articles in 2000, uh, a plea for forceful cultural integration for immigrants and not being so lukewarm about your national history. Again, the Dutch should be uh, proud of their history, and they should force immigrants to accept the history, to accept the Dutch identity. And he takes, I think it's interesting, he takes uh, uh, Leibhardt, which is previous uh, analysis of pillarization, as an example that you need a national consensus. And the idea is, of course, that behind the, the diversity of the pillars, there was a kind of national consensus that bridged it. Well, it's very striking, and I think it's, it's interesting for our discussions of in and out and belonging. It's very striking that the chapter with Leipart is about a narrow national consensus. And Leipart's point, and that's why pillarization is more interesting than I used to think it was, is uh, the, the idea is that um, pillarization only works when the rift between the pillars is very deep, when there's a radical... Uh, division, and that allows the elites of the different uh, pillars to strike a kind of compromise in a kind of uh, backroom uh, negotiations. As soon as the rift between the pillars become less, uh, then globalization does not work uh, anymore. So precisely the consensus for, for Leipzig is very narrow, is very uh, superficial. So, uh, so much therefore for Dutch unity. Uh, belonging for Dutch citizens in those days was a precarious balancing between being, for me, Protestant and being Dutch. Uh, we had two histories of our liberation war against the Spanish, uh, 
Protestant one that was taught at the Free University, which was a Protestant university, and a Catholic one that was mainly taught in Nijmegen. And if you studied history in Nijmegen, you heard different things than if you would study history in uh, at a Free University. I must confess to get closer to the museums that uh, I'm still, uh, for me, the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam is still a very peculiar building because it Breeze is a strong monastic sphere. For me as a Protestant, it's like a, a monastery, and that's not by accident, because the architect uh, Kuipers was one of the four men of the Catholic emancipation in the 19th century. Jed, I've just mentioned the example to see how deep the, to show how deep the uh, diversity, the lack of unity uh, is in uh, people, for people of my generation. Uh, now back to the central question. Uh, Duane will tell me when I'm uh, talking too long. Um, uh, what can such a complex uh, genealogies of national unity and internal difference say about present day predicaments of the museums and notably the predicament of ethnographic museums? How can museums position themselves in the often painful struggle of nation states to accommodate internal difference and to temper the inherent tendency in nationalism to homogeneization? The Cameroon way of dealing with internal difference uh, suggests uh, several strategies. Uh, one is a complete erasure of internal difference, and uh, for Cameroon, this attempt at to erase uh, an, uh, internal differences certainly did not apply to ethnic differences. It would be impossible to erase those, but to a different internal other, the UPC, uh, the Union des Populations du Cameroon. Ahitio's stress on unity was not, not only inspired by ethnic divisions, but even more by the role of his rival, the uh, Union de, the UPC, uh, in the struggle for independence. This uh, UPC was, um, since 1945, one of the most vocal movements for independence in Francof Francophone Africa, and it was only due to sly maneuvering of the French that the more cooperative leader, as it was called, uh, Amadou Ahitio, became the architect of independence. Since then, the Ahitio regime was haunted by the memory of the UPC, doing anything to erase the memory of this uh, former movement. Uh, in 1958, the uh, French succeeded in capturing and killing Um Niobe, as we see here, the charismatic leader of the UPC who had become a guerrilla in the south. Uh, Ahitio advised them uh, the, to bury uh, Um Niobe and inside a huge uh, block beton, a, 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 uh, what do you say, a block of uh, concrete, uh, so that the grave would not be uh, become a place of pilgrimage. This, uh, concrete block is a kind of symbolical for erasing the memory of uh, the UPC. And I think it's interesting that the case shows that even for a highly authoritarian regime, it's impossible to really efface such memories. Uh, more recently, after 2000, uh, former UPC leaders have been, been instrumental in resurrecting old rumors that have dramatic consequences in the country in the present. Uh, the UPC leaders now refer to uh, old stories on a certain Dr. Ozula, a leading figure in the decolonization of Cameroon, who would have corrupted the country's upcoming elite, and notably Ahitio. Ahitio is always mentioned by name, by initiating them into same-sex practices. And you may be familiar that uh, Cameroon is one of the most homophobic countries in Africa nowadays, and this rumor plays a clear role. It creates a kind of idea that the whole elite is corrupted during the decolonization pro process. Uh, people speak about Le PD de la République, uh, the faggots of the Republic, and that's one of the explanations why suddenly there is this kind of moral panic about homophobia. So I, it's, of course, there's a lot more to say about this example for me. There is a kind of irony that Ahitio now, the memory of Ahitio is smeared. He would be a homosexual, which is kind of quite shocking for people in Cameroon. But it has this struggle over diversity, this struggle over uh, othering, has a kind of uh, has effect up to the present. Quickly to the Dutch present, the Dutch, uh, the Dutch example. The Dutch, of course, had many others in the context of the song I was taught to sing in the primary school. The main other at that time was the German, 
the Brit was a good second. So this was the kind of authoring that fortified the idea of one national unity. But in everyday life, the other for me, okay, thank you, that's largely in there. But in everyday life, the other for me at the time was rather the Catholic. And this very much challenged the idea of national unity and asked for all sorts of precarious balancing. Can Catholics be good citizens? After all, the Catholics only listen to the Pope, so no, they cannot be good citizens. That were really very important arguments uh, in those days. Uh, there was, of course, also the colonial other. The next speaker will speak also about that, I understand. <laughs> And this othering was highly conducive to strength and national unity. There was an other who was really other, and so we, it strengthened the idea of we and them. The problem, I think, for uh, the past, and I think it's changing now, but as no ethnographic museums, of course, risk to be caught up in this logic. The nation state has an inborn drive to unify and to efface internal divisions, and the ethnographic museum offers ample possibilities to provide others who are clearly different and therefore strengthen the feeling of a we. It is maybe that tendency towards an unequivocal documentation of difference that made me wary of the ethnographic museums I came to know when I started studying anthropology in the 60s. Of course, then already, there were already uh, also exceptions, but in my memory it was all about strange objects that were explained in flat, straightforward terms, just a little note that uh, explicitly that pinned down the object and thus it was illustrating an other way of life. Nowadays, the uh, this tension between a national we and internal differences have taken on uh, new uh, dimensions. The other has become part and parcel of everyday life in the Netherlands, inside the Netherlands. And the examples above may point to a way for dealing with such tensions in new settings. Again, I uh, have to be uh, very modest, and I know there are many people in the room who are better equipped to answer such questions uh, for the museum, but still I give it a try. I was wondering to what extent um, the recent turn in anthropology, to uh, the, met the turn towards materiality, especially in the study of religion, but also in other fields of anthropology, can offer some help here. I think that um, the focus on objects, and I understand that museums want to be less and less only uh, busy with objects, but still even objects could, uh, uh, could, could contain a solution in the sense that it is ever more possible, or there's ever more emphasis in anthropology to show, to emphasize the different meaning of objects, that objects are, to, are uh, going through a process, that objects are constantly changing. Uh, as my last slide, oh, that has scored. <laughs> well, something that is not important. Uh, I had a slide of uh, some sort of, of various notions from anthropology who could help maybe here. I'm not so sure about uh, Latour's agency, uh, agency of Things, but I understand it will come up later. Uh, for anthropology, agency of things seems to mean ontology, and the way anthropologists work with ontology I find deeply uh, problematic in the sense that it, it's a risk to bring back a kind of essentialist notion of culture, and museums have to be very, very wary of that. Uh, uh, the, of course, the Leuze's ontology, in the sense of uh, mille plateaux and assemblage, is very promising to bring to give life to objects, to give a pol polyvalence uh, to objects. I'm less confident about the binary oppositions inspired by Viviro de Castro's pers perspectivism, but I think a very good uh, opening, a very good perspective is still provided by Apadurai, Arjun Apadurai, Social Life of Things, uh, that might be a better guide to bring out the ambiguity of objects and their different uh, implications. The challenge seems to me to show uh, objects in movement, to show the capacity of uh, objects for shifting and for taking on new and uh, constantly uh, different meanings. That's where I want to start. <laughs>